opportunity to do in-depth research, to work with the staff on all aspects of museum work, whether it's education or exhibitions to collections and visitor engagement. Um, and professional development is a big part of it and next step career path finding. But with archives closed and so many challenges over the last few years, what we found in working with this group of fellows and in this time was that, you know, the greatest strength and the heart of this program is when we can provide our fellows an opportunity, um, well, when we can give the fellows the structure and the time and the support to, sorry, I'm leaving the mic, um, to really ask questions and to take risks, to find their voice, to make work that matters to us and to them. And Brooke and uh, Izzy and Oriana and Adeza, who are not with us today, but with us in spirit, um, and we'll see them soon. You all have accomplished all of this and so much more. And I just wanna tell you, it's been an honor to work with you and that um, I really appreciate your amazing work, your brilliance, your insight, but also your patience and your grace in a time that's been full of uncertainty and change. And I could go on and talk about the program and our great fellows all day, but I want you to hear directly from them. So um, we'll start soon, but I do also wanna just thank Warner Shook. If we had to go through two years of pandemic, I can't think of another amazing uh, coach and guide to go through it with. Warner's been working with the fellows and with us from lockdown and back again and to get ready for today and this very moment. So I'm gonna stop talking. We'll have a little time for questions after um, Izzy and Brooke present. So hold your questions until, until then. But without further ado, I am really pleased to present Izzy Bowling. Bowling, and I'm going to be talking to you today about my project, A History of Land Protections and Sustainable Actions to Support Ecological Habitats Today, which is kind of a long title, but it just goes to say that my project was about the history of land protection in the United States and how it relates to coal's own environmental thinking. As a site, we've done previous research connecting coal to such thinkers as Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, John Muir, and their own writings and artworks and environmental philosophies. And we wanted to see if these could be connected to a parallel history of land protection in the United States. And this was going to be done primarily through looking at the facts and figures of namely the national park system to create a timeline of protected land in the country. And additionally, looking here in New York at the forest preserves and the Forever Wild Act. In addition to this timeline and this data, I was also going to be thinking about how to better enact Cole's own environmental philosophies on site today through greening initiatives and new programming. And the protection of land was something that Cole did think a lot about. He speaks in lecture on American scenery about a favorite walk down by Catskill Creek that in Europe would be considered as one of the gems of the earth. It would be protected by law from desecration, but its beauty is gone, and that which a century could not restore is cut down. So this land that Cole loved so much was not being protected in the way that he wanted it to be. And like Cole, a century later, I also had a favorite walk, a small piece of conservation land that was right across the street from my house. And we're lucky enough to live in a time where land protection is something that's thought about and something that we can enjoy. So it goes to show how much, as a country, we've grown in our own relationship with land and our desire to protect it. And this is a relationship that has played out very prominently here in the Catskills that have seen the, the full spectrum of human interaction with land and relationship with their landscape. It was originally inhabited by the Mohican and Lenape people who would use the riverbanks as agricultural land, the river as a fishing resource, and the mountains for hunting. They were regrettably pushed out by settlers 
and, enter, and years later, Cole came to this landscape and absolutely fell in love with it, and it inspired his own environmental philosophies and desires to protect and preserve the landscape. Sadly, it was not protected in his own lifetime, but decades later it was as part of the New York State Forest Preserve, and it was made wild, forever wild 10 years later in 1894, and now happily consists of around 300,000 acres of reforested land that is loved and protected in the way that it should be. So with this relationship in mind, I started my project by thinking about the national park system as the most general and well-known model of land protection in the United States. So I began by looking at lots of data and numbers and reports and combing through lots of old typewritten documents that I had to try and read. And I was able to create a uh, timeline of how the acreage of the national park system has grown from its official creation in 1916 to today. And before I go to the next slide, I want you all to think about what you think the line of this graph will look like. Are there decades within that time span where you think there's been more growth within the national park system where more land has been protected? Are there periods of time where it's slower and more steady? So just think about that for a second. And this is the line that I came up with, which was surprising in several ways to me. The first being that going into this project, I had kind of expected there to be a kind of a steeper section in the 60s and 70s with the environmental movement with a greater increase in protected lands. But overall, the line is pretty slow and steady. There's not, in terms of decades, any one period where there's more growth or less growth except for one day in December, oh, in December of 1978 when President Jimmy Carter created nine new national monuments all in Alaska and nearly doubled the size of the national park system, which means that over half of the land in the national park system is in Alaska, begging the question of how the rest of that land looks within the context of the lower 48 states. So I wanted to show you this map from 1931, which shows the locations of the different national parks. You can see Yellowstone up here. You can kind of see the Great Smoky Mountains. You kind of see Acadia up in the corner. And then 90 years later is this similar map that shows locations of the land in the national park system. And you can see that even across 90 years, in the context of the United States, it hasn't changed that much. It hasn't really grown as much as we think it has. Um, the national park system boasts around 85 million acres of land, but within the context of the total US land area, that actually only makes up around 3% of um, the total United States land area. So it's not really as big as we have the conception that it is. So with all these numbers and facts and figures in mind, not really telling the full picture of our own relationship with protected lands, I wanted to look at the motivations and policies and management strategies that played out within the founding and running of the early national parks. And a major theme that kept coming up was economics and the economics of scenery. There was this very controversial thesis that was put forth in the 80s that has this idea that the early national parks were only conserved because they were quote unquote worthless lands. They were not economically valuable in the traditional sense that they could not be used as farmland for homesteading. They didn't have the mineral wealth to justify large mining claims. And so the way that the government and the railroads and other people who were taking advantage of Western lands were able to exploit this was by turning them into national parks based on scenery. And this is reflected in the early boundaries of parks that were mainly focused on protecting scenic vistas. And this early focus on scenery and economic exploitation um, results in a large emphasis on tourism and policies that benefit tourism. There was an inordinate amount of time and effort and money that was done by the national park system and by the railroads to increase visitation and passenger travel that portrayed the national parks as places of wonder and scenic beauty, places where one could fall in love and become immersed in the country's history. 
They were places of magic and legends and lore. And this is a good moment to step aside and acknowledge that the national parks do represent stolen lands and are part of a very complicated history of the relationship between the national park system and the indigenous people who are living in these areas. A lot of the national parks were um, created by violating treaty rights and hunting rights that had already been established. And on top of all this, um, the tribes themselves were used as tourist material to get people to visit the national parks. They were themselves a tourist attraction. Their religions and myths and legends were used in promotional material. It was very widely acknowledged that parks represented sacred sites to Native Americans. And coming full circle, there's now a movement to return national park lands to the, the tribes that they were taken from. And so to summarize all of these themes, I wanted to share with you this little memo that appears in the US Railroad Administration Guides to the National Parks. It's from the Secretary of the Interior during that time, and it reads, to the American people, Uncle Sam asks you to be his guest. He has prepared for you the choice places of the continent, places of grandeur, beauty, and wonder. He has built roads through the deep cut canyons and beside happy streams which will carry you to these places of comfort and has provided lodgings and food in the most distant and inaccessible places that you might enjoy yourself and realize as little as possible the rigors of the pioneer traveler's life. These are for you. These are the playgrounds of the people. To see them is to make more hearty your affection and admiration for America. So this one simple statement really speaks for itself in highlighting the, the amount of entitlement that went into people's relationship with the national parks. They were for human enjoyment, not for wildlife conservation. They were places of developed comfort that was comparable to what one would find in a city. They were places that were largely being linked to the national identity of the time. And this early emphasis on human enjoyment leads to a lot of really strange policies and questionable decisions within the early years of the national parks including but not limited to feeding bears in garbage pits for the nightly enjoyment of visitors, killing predatory animals to increase populations of good animals such as deer. There's anecdotes of the deer of Yosemite coming down to the campgrounds each evening to be fed by visitors. They would regularly stock lakes and waterways with fish from as far away as Germany and Scotland, and these were often lakes that were never meant to support natural fish populations. And in addition to all these uh, questionable decisions, the parks were also more developed than we might think of a uh, conservation area being today. There were large hotels that were often owned and operated by the railroads to increase their profit. So generally not um, looking like and managed as wildlife reservations that we might expect them to be. And a lot of these decisions we're not really thought about until the early 30s when a man named George Wright conducted a wildlife survey of the national parks and brings forward the idea that these decisions are wreaking a lot of havoc on the ecosystems that they are meant to protect and that there should be a better communication between science and national park system policy that was not being implemented at the time. And in the midst of this very scientific report detailing all these very awful decisions, he has this really beautiful, poignant psychological moment that has really stuck with me throughout my research that I wanted to share with you all. I'm not gonna read the whole quote, but I'll give you the, the gist of it. He says that man abhors change, and he comes from the city, and he expects the same amount of comfort that he would find there. He comes from the zoos, and he expects the same sort of interaction with the animals. He sees a bear at a garbage pit, He's seen a bear in the national parks. He can go home and tell his friends. He's satisfied. But this is a very different experience than the man that goes out into the wilderness on the hiking trails and is able to see a bear in its natural habitat, feeding in its natural way, being acted upon by all the ecological forces that have been acting upon bears for millennia, the same ecological forces that are acting upon us. And this sentiment is very similar to something that Cole puts forth an essay on American scenery when he says that he who looks on nature with a loving eye gains a much 
more deeper understanding and appreciation for the natural world than those who wander loose about and nothing see. Both George Wright and Cole are asking people to turn an active gaze on the world around them in order to better our own relationship with the world around us. And sadly for George Wright, with the interruption of World War II, these changes he's advocating for don't really come to pass in a way that um, would have been beneficial, although they do stop killing predatory animals, which is lovely. But it wasn't until the 60s with the rise of the environmental movement that there are a number of other reports that are trying to advocate for better wildlife management strategies within the national parks. The um, main one being the Leopold Report, which really emphasizes that through years of mismanagement, the parks do not look as they did when they were preserved in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and that a lot of the efforts of the national park system should be in restoring these environments. Um, although slow to enact change, uh, the Leopold Report does influence the reinstitution of controlled burning within the national parks, which has greatly um, improved forest ecosystems, as well as the reintroduction of wolves and Yellowstone, which has greatly influenced and improved the ecosystem there. And so with this general history of the national park system in mind, I wanted to also touch on a few of the other models of land protection that I looked at throughout my research. The first one being here in New York, where we have the forever wild forest preserves that were, although originally um, preserved for economic reasons, now represent this really unique patchwork of state-owned protected wilderness land and privately owned, more developed land, which is a very different model from the large swaths of wilderness in Alaska that we kind of associate with the national park system. And aside from these, there's also organizations such as the Audubon Societies and Scenic Hudson here in New York that represent uh, another model of citizens who come together to advocate for and lobby on behalf of wilderness and are now both working on trying to manage land in an ecologically sound manner that balances the human developed um, qualities that have already been um, instituted with the natural world that exists alongside it. And so with all of this in mind, it brought forth a lot of really interesting questions about what the priorities of land protection should be. Um, should it be to protect large swaths of wilderness that we kind of associate with the national park system? Should it be more of an interconnected patchwork like the New York State Port Forest Preserves? Um, who should be protecting this land? Is it the federal government, the state government, private organizations, small municipal, municipal conservation land like the the conservation land I grew up hiking in? And how can we better balance our own relationship with the natural world and the development that has already taken place um, with everyone else, uh, the plant and animal inhabitants that live alongside us? And so thinking about these questions on site today, I um, pioneered a new greening initiative on site, which uh, the site uh, joined the Pollinator Pathway, which is a collection of different lands that are managed in a pollinator-friendly way, trying to create habitat corridors of land that is managed in a more ecologically friendly capacity. And I also introduced a new series of programs over the summer called Art in the Garden, which as Cole and George Wright advocated for, really pushed participants to turn an active gaze on the world around them to better foster a connection with the natural world. And so thank you all for listening. And I would, it's my pleasure to. Yes, thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce my fellow fellow, Brooke Cranster. Thank you, Izzy. So, as you might have heard, my name is Brooke Cranser. I was also a 2020-2021 Cole Fellow, and my primary research project was examining Thomas Cole's 1843 painting, River in the Catskills, working closely with the digital education team.
Additionally, I worked with the curatorial team to develop the upcoming exhibition, Thomas Cole's Studio, Memory and Inspiration, and secured image rights for the catalog. I also worked with curator Kate Mancanary to plan two exhibitions traveling with the Cole Show to Albuquerque that will feature contemporary artists Kiki Smith and Shi Guari. And finally, I worked with Kate and associate curator Amanda Malmstrom to launch the Cole site's first online exhibition featuring our collection highlights. Today, I want to share my research on Thomas Cole's River in the Catskills with you. So this landscape is notable among Thomas Cole's paintings in that it includes the visual signs of industry that the artist typically edited out of his works. Note, for instance, man holding an ax right there in the foreground. My aim was specifically to investigate the industry and the people depicted and not depicted in the painting. Why did Cole include them? And what did they tell us about this moment in Catskill's history? The goal of this research is to bring to light and begin to better understand the lives and varied perspectives of the other people who lived in Catskill during Cole's time here, 1836 to 1848. This work will allow the narrative at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site to both extend beyond Thomas Cole and better inform visitors of the context in which he worked, a context by which his art was profoundly influenced. This research is part of the, the Thomas Cole Site's Digital Education Project. The project's objective is to have an interactive digital program available in classrooms in Catskill and beyond for students to use to learn about this era in Catskill's history and the nuances of issues relevant in both the 19th century and today, namely the conflict between environmental preservation and industrial development. The main subject of my research focused on the main industrial development depicted in the 1843 painting, the building of the Canajoharie and Catskill Railroad. I began this project by familiarizing myself with secondary research on River in the Catskills, development in Catskill during Cole's time here, and the artist himself. Research by former fellows Anne Rich, Alex McCarty, and Adam Grimes was especially helpful. Beyond secondary sources, I am further indebted to conversations, expertise, and support on this topic from Adam Grimes, Heather Perubeck, the Vetter Research Library, and archivist and Greene County historian John Palmer, who helped me identify archival materials related to the construction of the railroad that form much of the basis of my findings. So, what were these findings? Cole's visual cues guided my research focus. Compared to other Cole paintings, like View on the Catskill Early Autumn, completed six years before River in the Catskills, the later painting is unusual. Whereas this earlier landscape offers a lush, untouched vision of Catskill Creek, more in line with Cole's other paintings in the same series, the later painting depicts the same scene with all the ravages of the ax. Flat, vast, clear-cut tracts of land, smoke, from what could be distant tanneries, the man with the ax standing next to a dead tree stump, and most peculiar of all, a train. Why would a man who called trains merciless and tyrannical put one in one of his paintings? Knowing that Cole painted this piece without a commission, I believe that he intended it as a warning of what could be Catskill's future. If Cole did paint River in the Catskills with this intention, his cautions came a little late. By the time he finished the painting, the, Cats the Canajoharie and Catskill Railroad that he depicted was already defunct. The railroad, which was the first in the area, began its existence on April 19, 1830. The long-term goal of the line was to link Catskill to the Erie Canal. The canal, which opened in 1825, was blamed for a decrease in business in the town and the railroad company and its supporters hoped that the line would recapture Catskill's commercial potential. One of the intentions for the track was to provide a direct link between New York City and the region's tanneries, one of the most important industries in the area at the time and one of the main drivers of the deforestation that Cole famously lamented. Advocates of the railroad said that, quote, with these immense avenues for trade, 
the town of Catskill is destined to increase in wealth and population with great rapidity. For a brief timeline on the railroad, the groundbreaking ceremony was held right here in town in 1831. However, no construction followed and little more was heard from the railroad company for four years. In 1835, the project was renewed. Six of the railroad directors after this point were Catskill locals. By the close of 1838, the first 26 miles of track were largely complete, and by 1840, a locomotive engine was in regular use on the line. However, March of that same year brought the beginning of the end of the Canajahari Catskill Railroad. A bridge collapsed underneath the train, killing one passenger and seriously injuring another. By 1842, the tracks had been sold and destroyed. The year before Cole finished River in the Catskills, the railroad he painted was gone. Cole's feelings towards the railroad are clear and well known. He wrote about his disdain, both for the construction of the railroad in his beloved Catskill and for train travel itself. He lamented the destruction of grove of trees for the line and complained of the hurry, noise, and restlessness of train travel. But, as a Catskill resident, was Thomas Cole alone in these feelings? What did his neighbors think? Did the railroad bring jobs, returns on investments, or otherwise improve the lives of his neighbors? From here, we expand the conversation beyond Thomas Cole to look at the town as a whole. Historical records indicate that the residents of Catskill were hopeful for the railroad in its early years. A plurality of investors were even Catskill locals, putting more than $42,000 into it, a huge sum in the 1830s. Even as early as 1832, however, there are signs of suspicion towards the railroad. But this was not because the people of Catskill lamented improvement marring the natural landscape of their town, but rather because these improvements were not happening quickly enough. As construction delays continued and progress was inconsistent, villagers' hope for promised prosperity turned to disappointment and anger. An interesting example, a letter to the Catskill Recorder printed on March 29, 1832, shows how quickly public opinion about the railroad began to shift among some Catskill residents. In a sarcastic note, an anonymous writer requests that the newspaper, quote, inform us whether the railroad committee have made any progress in their labors, and if not, what the reasons are that have prevented them. They continue, please enlighten us, Mr. Editor. We, simple souls, supposed that the child, whose christening was attended with so much pomp and parade, would have met with a better fate than strangulation in the cradle at the hands of its godfathers. But if such is the fact, while we hang our harps upon the willows, we are still anxious to pay appropriate honors to the illustrious dead. Your answer will influence the proceedings of many subscribers. <laughs> the ironic, frustrated tone of this letter and the assertion that it would influence many subscribers printed in all capital letters are revealing as to the concern among Catskill villagers less than a year after the groundbreaking ceremony and before six years of slow progress and delays. The editor's response that they had received several letters about the railroad and had selected the shortest also illuminate the extent of residents' upset. As revealing as this letter is, it becomes even more intriguing in light of a letter written a few weeks following on April 14th 1832. Mentioned in William F. Helmer's Rip Van Winkle Railroads, this letter describes an elaborate mock funeral held for the railroad by Catskill villagers. Helmer prints, quote, the Catskill people had a very great funeral last week. They had a coffin made for the purpose of burying the railroad. They had lamps with mottos on them. On the coffin was wrote, who killed Cock Robin? They went before Judge Cook's house and there broke all the lamps and then marched up to the place where they celebrated the breaking of the ground, playing the death march, and then buried the coffin. And then they thought the road was dead and buried. 
I have not been able to find this letter, cited in 1970 as being from Catskill resident Nelson Smith to his brother Hiram, both of whom are actually buried right down on Spring Street. In the newspapers collected at the Vetter, I could find no mention of any mock funeral procession around this time. As such, the details of this supposed procession remain unverified. But despite the lack of information about the mock funeral, the letter to the Catskill recorder becomes especially intriguing in its light. Printed just a week or two before Smith claims that the procession occurred, the author uses metaphors about life and death in reference to the railroad, personifying it as a victim of strangulation in the cradle and pointing to its godfathers, the railroad directors, as the murderers. Most interesting of all is the statement that the local people were anxious to pay appropriate honors to the illustrious dead. Could this letter have been written by one of the people planning the mock funeral? Or could these metaphors of murder have inspired whoever did plan it? For now, the answers are lost to time. But the strong feelings surrounding the perceived death of the project point to this desire for the railroad in Catskill. This was an early sign of anger towards the railroad company, not because they were building the railroad, but because they were not. While this funeral was premature, the progress on the railroad in the years that followed was slow, and public opinion grew increasingly negative. With stockholders unable to come up with funds, a flood causing $10,000 of damage to the track, and finally, the bridge collapse that killed a man named Jaheel Tyler, 10 years after the mock funeral was held, the railroad was indeed dead. While public opinion on the railroad seems to be largely in opposition to Cole's disapproval, he was not entirely alone. Peter Van Vechten Jr. lived in the house towards which the train is rolling in Cole's painting. In an article Peter wrote years later, he recalls his father protesting the railroad's outlined course on their property, but despite his family's protests, the track that was ultimately built ran as close to their home as the railroad company dared, destroying, among other things, the family's garden and pig pen. Besides his own family, he claimed that Teamsters, steamboat workers, and canal drivers also opposed the construction of the railroad as they didn't want to lose work. However, at the same time, he remembers that everyone was elated at the prospect of prosperity, even recalling a boy he knew in 1838 saying that the Canajahari and Catskill Railroad was, quote, one of the greatest things that ever went anywheres. <laughs> of course, one of the most pressing questions remains, what was life like for those who actually built the railroad? Who were these people? Were they compensated fairly for their labors? Unfortunately, this question leads to murky territory. One of the main difficulties of archival research is that archives are not neutral they inherently reflect societal power structures. As such, researching people who do not hold substantial wealth or influence, like the typical railroad worker, can be difficult, as oftentimes their documents are simply not preserved. However, in this case, some records do exist. There is a book of receipts made by the railroad company in 1841 to two at the Vetter Research Library. This book includes the names of people who worked on the line and their compensation for various labors. For one example, a man named John C. Canine was paid $1.75 for his work on the track. As these receipts do not list hours worked, it's difficult to say what an hourly or daily wage would have been. For a little perspective, a loaf of bread at the time would have cost around six cents. However, there remain many unknowns about the workers and their compensation. But with 104 checks written in less than a year during the final days of the railroad, it can be said that the railroad did provide some labor. Despite Cole's stance against the railroad itself, it seems that for the most part, Catskill residents overwhelmingly wanted it. While Cole felt strongly enough about the track to paint it into his 1843 landscape, by this time, it was already gone, to the disappointment of many of his neighbors. Cole may have felt gratification at its failure, but it likely hurt the livelihoods of many other local people and dashed hopes that Catskill would become wealthier or even a center of business. 
As Peter Van Becten Jr. wrote, many castles in the air were demolished when the railroad was. But the railroad that did not succeed at first did come in the end. Today, we're all familiar with the tracks that run along the Hudson River, transporting goods and people across the nation. The deforestation that it left in its wake also came to fruition. At what cost did the railroad eventually come to Catskill? This research has many applications, but the most important is the digital education program. This program will enable students to step into River in the Catskills, to look at the changes represented in the painting, and have conversations by those who are affected by and initiating these developments. By turning historical material into an interactive script, students will be able to participate in discussions with various historical characters, including Thomas Cole, Peter Van Becten Jr., and the president of the railroad. These findings matter because while the Thomas Cole National Historic Site is a museum focused on Thomas Cole, it is vital to bring in the historic voices of the community in which he lived. Beyond Catskill II, these interconnected issues of the balance between economic development with environmental preservation mattered to Cole and are still urgent today. The environmental impact of large industries is still a major concern to us, as well as other issues, such as gentrification resulting from the improvement of towns the way that Catskill residents hope that the railroad would improve their own, something we can see in Catskill now. As a museum, we must ask ourselves how we can engage both our history and the contemporary moment that we occupy. It is vital for us to grasp the nuances that existed in the story we tell about Catskill and Cole's time and make connections to why and how it still matters today. Thank you. Thank you.